The time is now 1.03 and a quorum of the board is present. The State Board of Ed meeting of June 15, 2010 is called to order. And we're going to have approval of the State Board of Education minutes from May 11. So I move approval wait. of the minutes as delivered. Second. Moved by Liz, supported by Cassandra. Any corrections or comments or changes? All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, same. President Strauss. Well, thank you. Well, I wanted to tell you a little bit of the follow-up to our approval of our report last month. Um, we started meeting with some of the legislators. Uh, Carolyn Curtin has been at most of the meetings. She and Cassandra met with uh, Representative Elson, uh what's his name? Elsenheimer uh, first, and then uh, Carolyn and I met with Senator Kuypers and Senator Jelenic, <coughs> and uh, I think Carolyn, oh, you met with Terry, Representative Terry Brown, mm -hmm. uh, Chairman of the House Appropriations Committee, and of course Senator Jelenic is Chairman <coughs> of the Senate Approves, and Senator Kuypers is Chairman of the Senate Education Committee, and Representative Elsenheimer is a minority leader in the House. So these are key people. So far, we haven't gotten bringing endorsements. Uh, when I was at the meetings, uh, they indicated that they really hadn't had a chance to really study it, and they were looking forward to doing that later. Uh, uh, Senator Kuypers indicated that he's very supportive of uh, year-round schooling, so we thought that was something we told him we thought that there should be more time and, and uh, was very supportive of that, so that's something we might work with him on, but I don't know that we're going to get support for the whole thing. He's running for Congress, so August 3rd is a key date for him. Mm -hmm. uh, and Senator Jelenic is generally it was very interested and he has at least looked at it, but he's going to look at it more seriously. So uh, we're making progress, and the other meetings are being set up with Senator Bishop and Senator Thomas and with the Oakland Press, and uh, we'll, Beryl and, and, and Eileen are really terrific in doing all these things. I don't know how they do it all with just the two of them, but they're working at it, and uh, we'll continue to meet. So uh, we're eager to meet with the press as well to get this story out there because they keep talking about the need for bipartisan cooperation and we're showing them how it can be done and, and they should, <coughs> be, you know, we should be selling that that story a little bit harder, I think. So we're working at that. So I wanted you to know that those, those meetings, and I want to thank Carolyn for doing so many of these. That was really great, Carolyn. It's my pleasure. And, and she was at the Teacher of the Year announcement and everything, so <laughs> everywhere. we're certainly going to miss you. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'll miss all of you. Not, not too late. <laughs> <laughs> too late to reconsider. But you're not going to <laughs> <laughs> I've worked at that a long time trying to get it to reconsider. <laughs> I haven't been very successful at that either. <laughs> I don't want to so. lose my happy home. <laughs> <laughs> I already told him I wasn't. <laughs> Speak up a little bit to the back of the room. Oh, okay. <coughs> Sorry about that. I, I don't know. Is this? Oh, here. here's the speaker. Okay. I'll uh, talk a little bit. <laughs> 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 I thought it was loud, but apparently it wasn't. Uh, let's see. So, uh, we've also gotten comments on. Uh, the, on the email from people who are still commenting on this report, and some of them have criticism of one or two items. I've told them that, that first of all, that we all compromised, and there were some things in it that each of us didn't like, but that as a whole we supported it because this is the way, as Cassandra put it last time, this is the way democracy is supposed to work, and, and legislate and policy is supposed to be made. You're supposed to give, you give and take, and you compromise, and you come up with something that, that's, that's good. Maybe not perfect, but good. And as they say, you shouldn't, you know, not do good because you can't get perfect. 
So, and that this is a living document and we'll review it and if there are good suggestions, we will be glad to consider them. So that's what I've been telling people and I don't know what some of you have said. Uh, if I got a request from Senator Thomas to uh, endorse a group called the Drivers Against Texting and Talking, <laughs> which is a you know, good thing to be for, I think. So I said, okay. And then I got a letter from the director of the organization, <laughs> and, and I have to get more information because this just came. Uh, he would like to get support from this. He, they have to do a lot of educating of the drivers and the public about this. So they want to know if there's that some, something that the state board can do to help educate young drivers, especially young drivers and others about this. So I'm going to try to get more information and maybe ask for some endorsement from the board maybe next month or something. So that was just something out of the blue. Uh, I also, I, I attended the National Farm to Cafeteria Conference in Detroit last month. There were about <coughs> 700 people from all across the country who are really promoting the use of fresh farm products and using your locally grown pro produce to eat more healthy, have a more healthy diet, and also to support the local economy. And it was interesting, there were quite a few school people there, food service managers and others. And, and I learned uh, that Traverse City, for instance, has been doing this for about six years. And they really think it's a good idea, and they, they're really working at it. But the, I spoke to several other food service managers who are also working towards this and are, are trying it. What I found really interesting was that Detroit has eight schools that are use, using the local urban farms now sprouting mm -hmm. up to <coughs> supply their local farm to food, far, f farm to cafeteria or farm to food and in, in, uh, farm to school in, in Detroit, which was, I thought was interesting because I think that's where Detroit is ha ahead of the curve, and, mm -hmm. which is nice to hear about yes. something about. Detroit. So that was that was interesting, and this, this has become quite a movement of trying to promote this across the country, and it was very interesting. I, I just like to add while you're talking about that that um, the little school district I'm from they built a greenhouse, and this has been in effect two or three years probably, and they use the the things for salads and that that are grown mm -hmm. right on the school ground. Mm -hmm. the that's ledges. that's so terrific. It's kind of the same idea. Right, and this fits in with our NASB grant. <coughs> which is to promote healthy nutrition and uh, w which we're doing in w to our own standards. And we also attended, uh, Liz and I, uh, I don't, Cassandra, I don't think you were part of it. I don't know. I think you couldn't <laughs> do it that day. <laughs> uh, it was a virtual, it was, this was a multi-state meeting, virtual meeting, which was interesting. And they, we heard what other states have been doing. And they're really quite impressive. Uh, so there were some good ideas presented. And we'll be meeting again next month to uh, review what we've done the first year and make plans for the second year. So that's 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 all part of our healthy nutrition, healthy school environment, so that the ch children are ready and in good physical condition to to learn. So uh, that was an interesting experience. I hadn't participated in one of those virtual meetings with you know, people from Pennsylvania, Mississippi, uh, Arkansas, and, and Michigan are the first four states. And then the four, they, they're going to have four new states, Alabama, Kentucky, Georgia, and North Carolina. And they participated as well. So that was an interesting experience. And now this last week, uh, Nancy Danhoff and I were uh, participated in NASB study groups. Nancy's on the 21st century educator one, and I'm on the, the structure of schools, time and technology in the 21st century schools, which is very interesting. And there were some good presentations. The first one was on international benchmarking, and a lot of the focus was on teacher preparation. And I know you were in Finland, but she pointed out that Finland 
accepts only the top 10% of students into their teacher training institutions. Singapore, the top 20%. Mm -hmm. So that they have elevated the recognition of the importance of <coughs> teachers and they don't want just anybody to become a teacher. They want the best yeah. students they've got. And they start out and then they recognize these students as teachers as being <coughs> the very valuable members of society. So I thought that, that was a very telling point to me. Uh, and then there, they were, uh, there was general agreement, I would say, about replacing seat time in Carnegie unions with mastery of competence. We've talked about that. But the, the, the difficulty of getting away, from, we want to make sure that there's enough time for schooling to do all the things, to learn all the things that children have to learn nowadays to be competitive, uh, but also to, that they don't have to be tied to seat time. So that's, I, we try to reconcile those two things too. So that was a, an interesting issue. But the report will come out in October, and in the meantime, we'll be uh, helping to draft it and to edit it. So it was it was very worthwhile and interesting. And one of the members of the group that I was in is a, a member of the Maryland State Board, is uh, a professor of physics at the University of Maryland. And he's a member of an advisory committee on STEM education, which is to present its report, its recommendations to the White House in about a month. So I'll, I didn't know that there was such a committee, but there is, so <coughs> I think you should know that there is too, and talking about all this STEM education, which John <coughs> talks about a lot, and we're all it's so interested in. So uh, that report, you should be looking for that pretty soon. And then I learned, I was just telling Mike earlier that uh, CCSSO, the Organization of, of Superintendents and Commissioners and Chiefs, uh, has a program called the Next Generation Learners, delivering on our promise to educate every child. Mm -hmm. uh, and they have six uh, lab states, they call them. Uh, Maine, New York, West Virginia, Ohio, Kentucky, and Wisconsin. Uh, all the states were invited to participate. 27 res responded, and these six were selected to start, and the, they'll have another cohort pretty soon. But they're trying different way, different techniques of reaching every child. And mm -hmm. So they, we may be able to learn something from that study as well. So uh, let's see. Yeah, in those states, they have to, the states are it's sort of like the race to the top. You have to get the commitment of the state superintendent, the state board president, and the state union leader to sign on to this, uh, and, and including this, you know, so that they're all committed to working on it. So we'll have to find out more about that. They're just in the early stages of this lab program. And, but I thought it was interesting that CCS, I know, was doing that. So. So yeah, so that's uh, <coughs> that's. But I know that, that Liz has been visiting schools and writes very thorough reports on what she has seen. And you might want to say something after the, under at the end of the at the end of the meeting. Yeah. So <coughs> so thank you. Thank you, Kat. Thank you. Under the superintendent's report, uh, a few things. One, uh, I teach a class at Wayne State this time of year, a graduate class at night, and. Um, done this for about 15 years now and uh, asked John to uh, take his busy schedule and spend a little time last night with the students and really did a great job on the board, 3Rs report. And I think it was interesting for real teachers and principals and others who are in the field to see how sausage really is made, you mm -hmm. know, and how things <laughs> really happen. And I think it's a big surprise to them, a pleasant surprise. And I thought, did an outstanding job, to say the least, but also really represented the board well and, and, and really made the point that you, you, all of you have made over and over again that you've modeled for the legislature this bipartisan way. Uh, Rob acknowledged it earlier today, and it's very appreciated. Um, the school Improvement Grant. I'm, I'm, I think I might have come off a little more animated this morning than I should have on that <laughs> with respect to the press releases, but I, I or, or quotes, but I just, 
it is a new day. Um, it is what it is. We made a decision to put the top to the bottom list available to everyone because parents should have access to that. I think it also took away the idea that people would just kind of obsess about this 5% group and that's the group that's going to have uh, the opportunity to get up to $119 million um, to turn the schools around. And as you know, this is an important issue for those schools and for us because uh, those are probably going to be the same schools or, or large, in large number the same schools that with this year's data that will be available in the summer um, will look at as the schools that are in the reform district and, and eligible Eligible is probably not the perfect word, but for uh, ultimate state takeover and loss of their students and the money, if if, it, if in fact the trend line doesn't change to uh, student achievement going up, and that's why over this next year, Mary Alice is is uh, as interim as you know is putting an office together. The legislature has given us some supplemental money to try to carry that out, and our goal, as you know, is to. Uh, is to do such a good job on this together with these schools that, in fact, uh, Linda's, Linda and Mark have been working with them right from the beginning and, and to get to such a degree that we really don't have to exercise that authority. That would be the, that would be the ideal. Looking at New Orleans' experience, and this is patterned after New Orleans in, in many respects, the odds are there will be some of those schools and we need to be prepared for that and we'll have much more to report on that in the coming year. But I, I did want to clarify one thing that I don't think I did a good job this morning on, and that was I was reacting to an article that Marty showed me from one superintendent who was kind of complaining about the fact that we are using dated data. And the fact of the matter is you can't have both. We've had tremendous advice from all the associations and a lot of other folks that let's use growth data over time. Well, if you're using growth data over time, by definition, you're using three-year, two-year, one-year-old data. And once we have school just ended, and once we have data this summer that's up to date, we'll have the prior three years to use for growth. And it'll, so what it'll do is it will, it will take out the, the oldest year and put in this new year, but it still represents two of those years are going to be the same. And it represents our ability to see is the slope going in the right way. And I think uh, uh, the whole team that's worked on that, Sook's group as well as Joseph and the team on, on a fair hybrid that got approved by the feds last Friday, um, was, was excellent. I, I mentioned, I think I mentioned, that the Saginaw superintendent, mm -hmm. did I to this group? Yeah. Okay. And I, I think that's the approach to take. I, I, I admire those that are saying we're going to tackle this and we appreciate that there's funds to help us do that. And, but these, I, I also don't want to understate the um, efforts that I think almost all of those schools are taking and are going to go through to turn themselves around. And there's really harsh decisions they have to make. If you look at the four models that the feds allow, they're, mm -hmm. they're very harsh. The, the one piece I wish we could get changed, and we've talked to, uh, my group has talked to Arnie about it, and I think he's taken it under consideration and would um, ask maybe for the support of the, the State Boards of Ed group, is, is it does seem uh, a bit arbitrary that all of these call for the principal to be removed um, unless the principal has been there less than two years. And it would be a shame if a district felt that, yeah, the person's been there three years but has turned the building around and we're hoping to get more flexibility, but for now we don't have that. And I think it's one reason that in a sense is a harsher penalty for principals under this federal model than anyone right now. but. Here's it in a nutshell. It, it, in a way, it's fortuitous that this money's coming from the feds now, given that the state law kicks in next year. Yeah, that, that raises a question. Does this, are the criteria for the state, the list of schools, the same as the criteria for the feds? Yes. They are? So the, list, the schools will be the same schools? The reason they may not be exactly the same is we'll take out that one year oldest data and put in this summer's data. So oh. so two of the three, I think that's oh, a so fair way to describe it, again, it. Okay, it'll be more updated. It'll be words. marginally more updated, but that's why I was trying to say that the one superintendent kind of criticizing using old data, well, the only way you can get an understanding of credit for growth yeah. is if you look over a few years. And, and 
Joseph, please. And there's one other one other major difference, and that is that this this list that was just released was based on English language arts and mathematics. The one that will be released in the fall will be based on reading and mathematics, because we have only reading in grade three through eight um, from last fall on. Oh. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. But I think the other reason to have the top to bottom list is I think we had a district for a while that was arguing, I would say, I'm being a, maybe too candid about this, but making a case that we're in the bottom 5.3%, we're not in the bottom 5%. I don't think that's a good argument. And I don't think that your community is going to be particularly happy that just because you're marginally outside. If anything, we've had a number of districts call that are disappointed that they're not on the list because they're in a position where they know they have to really make progress and they're not going to have uh, an opportunity to weigh in on this $119 million. So I'm saying this maybe in a little more depth because that's the kind of feedback you'll get. I do believe the overwhelming number of folks are just going to work their tails off at the local level and our supports mm -hmm. are, are great. I, 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 I think we would do this again, but when I read some of this this morning, I thought we're one of the very few states, if not the only state, that gave a heads up. And, you know, the heads up is with the in intention of helping districts get ready for the likelihood that they were going to be on this list, not to message it in such a way that's not helpful or, or in this case, critical of what I think is a, a hardworking team that I work with, uh, you know, with, with things like we're using old data. We're using exactly the kind of data that we need to use, and it's what makes it a fair uh, approach is the fact that we're not looking at one test on one day, which is a legitimate criticism had, had we done that. But the, the world's changed. In fact, there's a very high profile, I, I don't want to call it out because I don't want to necessarily name any district, but a fairly high profile charter on the list that, uh, that I think is, is in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a place of like a wake-up call. Yeah. That the, the, the beauty of this is it's painful in the short run, but I know I've told you the story when I was a superintendent 20 years ago that we were, that we were without any malice kind of putting perfume over everything, and we just didn't drill down, and the culture wasn't to drill down on student achievement. It was to just take aggregate scores. And there are some problems with No Child Left Behind, but one of the good things about it is it forced us to disaggregate based on gender and race mm -hmm. and other issues that you could kind of see where your weak points are, and then when you know where your weak points are, you can do something about that. So this is very much, I think, in that spirit, and uh, <coughs> you know, more, to, more to come. Um, Liz and I attended the uh, MSD graduation, uh, you know, just, okay. it's a great, you know, if you get a chance, we'll try to get you a date, early. we didn't, the date was moved around a bit, but we'll try to yeah. get a date as early, because yeah. it's really just it's, a it's great. It's really impressive, I've, I've been to several of those Benson. over the years, yes. It's a Michigan school for right. the deaf, and uh, the board and the department operate that uh, uh, program directly. And it's just great to see some young people with their, their dreams being fulfilled as they're, I also thought a couple of the speeches were just mm -hmm. great, you know, very uh, uh, inspirational, really, in terms of the experience that these kids had and where it's bringing them uh, uh, in their life plans and very, very happy to see that. I have a little treat and surprise treat for you today in the middle of this because Liz has been... No saying, more hats, is it? Huh? No, no, no more hats. We're not, and I won't be singing YMCA, Rob. Uh, but this is one that... You're, you're, what do you work for the president? Spin his helmet. Okay. Um, Liz has said with some regularity and the rest of you have said we need to look for more occasions that we can bring like real life students yeah. to the table and I thought one thing I would try to do periodically is when I see something on a visit because I visit a different district every month Liz visits as you acknowledge half <laughs> many but this was a program I visited Wyoming and Godwin High School District and the reason I visited both is they've combined one superintendent who stepped up to this and I really think it's a model that I wish others would consider and it's usually not the superintendent that's the problem on that, and I, and I say this respectfully, but I think it's boards fear that they'll lose their identity. But I hope they'll talk to these districts because that's not what happened. They're just getting economies of scale. They had a retired business official, so now they're down to one for the two districts. It, it's a way to consolidate services in a humane way over mm -hmm. time, but still get the economies of scale so you can leave more 
uh, resources available for the kids in their programs. I, and, and I was impressed with lots of stuff, including the superintendent and the board. And they've anticipated change. But the one that I wanted to just highlight briefly is it's called the Wyoming Frontiers Program. And it's an online high school program that we granted the seat time waiver to very early on. Maybe, was it the first? or I think it was the first. And, you know, I, I kind of lost track of where we were going on the visit and suddenly we ended up in this program and <laughs> I heard these students uh, who uh, were kind enough to say they'd make it a point to join us today so I'd like to just briefly invite for a few minutes uh, Ryan Strayhorn and Holly Jansma up to the table here if you could join us for a second please and and maybe just and Alan the, you're welcome to come up too, sir, program director, but <laughs> I, I, you did it so succinctly for me, and I please have a seat. And I was wondering if you would uh, mind just sharing what this meant for you. I, it was a very impressive uh, real-life circumstance that I thought the board would appreciate. Do you want to go first? Or? Sure. My name is Ryan. Um, I actually was in Byron Center Public Schools. Um, my mom worked at Wyoming, and she heard about the Frontiers program, which Alice put on, um, and told me I should do it. Uh, my first two years of high school, freshman and sophomore year, um, I had health problems, um, chronic chest pain that no doctor in the world can um, diagnose. And I say that because I've been all the way to Mayo Clinic to try and figure it out. Um, so I ended up staying home during the school year, towards the end of the school year, and having to go in and take exams last minute and not do good on them <laughs> because I wasn't there. Um, and just to do at home and have a teacher come to my house and give me my homework and explain things, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so at this point, I mean, hearing this program, I was like, whoa, <laughs> I can do all this work at home and not have to worry about teachers. So, um, <laughs> and, and, and it's not worry about teachers. Okay. I'll watch myself. Thank you very much. <laughs> No, not worry about no, teachers in the sense that I don't have to go in and it's not any standard classroom where I'm sitting in a seat and if I miss a day, then no, oh, bummer, you, you know, you miss that question on the test once at the end of the semester or quarter or whatever. That's so, exactly. Yeah. So this online program, um, oh, the other thing, I own a business too. I started a business when I was 12, so and now I have a corporation that I have 26 people that work for me. And we're building on from there. So this has helped me because um, days that I have to go over to Detroit for a job or wherever, I can just say, hey, can I not come in? I'll make up the hours tomorrow. Okay, no problem. In fact, I graduated early. On top of all of this, on my business, my health, I graduated what, two months early, I think it was. So, I mean, it's a win-win situation. I got all my credits. I got a good GPA. I was accepted into college. I didn't even apply. <laughs> and I got a scholarship. Um, and I did dual enrollment during uh, high school as well. So it's worked out great for me, the fact that you, know, you, you go there after the first semester if you have your grades up and you, um, you, you've been there and you have good attendance, good behavior, et cetera, you get a free laptop. And at the end, if you graduate from the program, you get to keep it. Yeah. <laughs> no brainer. <I'm> nice. <laughs> <laughs> free laptop for college. So now my parents are like, okay, hey, what do you want for your graduation gifts? You have two laptops. <laughs> I don't really know. So um, you get the laptops, and um, normally, like all other students, it, it's in a single lab. You have desks, and you have your computers, chairs, plastic chairs, yay. Um, and then they have uh, couches. They added couches after the first semester. And so we take our laptops, flop on the couch, and work there <laughs> nice and comfy. Um, we can have drinks in the lab, too. So it's really a relaxed environment and somewhere that you'd want to go. It's a lot better than in... Excuse me. In my opinion, it's a lot better than the classroom where you have to sit there for eight hours and listen to a teacher or multiple teachers. Um, but to be able to go into a classroom, sit on the couch, do your schoolwork, um, your exams, your quizzes, and you get to have a drink there. <laughs> Open up a drink, take it whenever you want. And you have Soft teachers. Drink. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> wow. oh, okay. I'm 17. We're hoping right? for a fire. <laughs> um, can you, can you more mention, water. Ryan? You, you, because there were teachers in in with you, so right. if you could clarify yes, sorry, teachers, we have that a little bit. Four or five teachers. We have, uh, the uh, equivalent of 2.25 staff members in our two labs. Um, it's set up very collegiate style. Um, the the staff rotates through, um, so they may be with us for a couple hours and then go down the hall and teach history uh, or whatever. So there's certified staff there all the time. Um, they're working with the students. They're not only helping them with their, their coursework, but 
helping them with the time management skills, those pre-collegiate style, mm -hmm. you know, uh, skills that, you know, these kids, I'm hoping they'll come back to me in two years. They're both going to college in the fall. When they come back and say, you know, the, the struggles that my peers had their freshman year with, you know, time management and the independence and the, the newfound freedom that, you know, typical students don't get in a traditional classroom, they've already crossed that bridge. They've already addressed that and have had the opportunity to be weaned towards that. We've got structure in place, but that seat time yeah. is flexible in that the students earn more time away by demonstrating that they can handle that time away. Great. Thank you. Holly, how about you? Would you like to... Okay, well, I'm no Ryan. I don't own a company. I'm basically your your <laughs> average student all around. Um, I went to Granville uh, when I was in middle school, so I was a part of, obviously, a really big school. And it worked decently well for me, but I wanted to go to a Christian school then, and so I went to Calvin Christian for two years. And it's a small school and decent teachers, but they weren't showing me enough attention, I'd say and it was expensive, <laughs> so I decided to do the online program. I found out through my uncle, because he's the gym teacher there, and I it, I wish they would have had it when I was a freshman. I wish I would have started out there. The teachers are so eager and willing just to help you, and um, it's a very personal relationship that you build with them, and I liked that I could move at my own pace. I'd be doing math and I can just speed right through it and just if I needed help though that I could stop and go and reach out to a teacher. Um, I also, I do sports. I, I love tennis um, and so it helped me with that and I work full time for my parents. I'm training to be an optician right now. I'm gonna try to take the test and get certified in the fall. Um, I don't know, Frontiers is just awesome. It, Thank you. It gave our students the opportunity to immerse themselves as much or as little into a traditional high school experience as they chose to. Um, the needs of the 21st century student are from here to here. And we designed the program to try to address as many of them as we could rather than focus on, okay, at risk, we're going to take care of, or the accelerated kid. We're, we expanded that spectrum so that we could try to address as many of those needs as we could, you know, from the kid who as a kid at home or the kid who said I'm dropping out because my parents need me to work full time. Um, the seat time waiver has allowed us to do that so uh, I thank you all for supporting that. Um, it has really really made a dim uh, difference and an impact on a lot of lives. I, uh, for college I'm going to a small college in Tennessee and I looked it up and I actually had about a 4% chance of getting in and I got in because of how well I've done the past two years because of Frontiers, because of my grades being better and just me like, basically, literally, I started out about here. I had a 1.7 when I went to Calvin, and now I have, what do I have, a 2.6 or something like that? Three, but pretty I close. Well, you can know because your DE grades are Oh, uh, yeah, but basically, I just, I <laughs> peaked way up. Um, I've been working very hard, and um, so without Frontiers, I, would probably be going to a community college, which there's nothing wrong with that, but I want the college experience, so I'm really excited for From that. the business aspect, I wouldn't have my business where I was today if I didn't have the Frontiers program. Mm -hmm. Because, like I said, I go in the morning, I mean, my, my schedule during the week, because I go in the morning for three hours, I head to my KCTC program, and I go straight to my house and work in my office, AKA room. So, <laughs> <laughs> working on the computer, <laughs> taking phone calls, sending phone calls out, uh, left and right. and. Mm -hmm. Without that, I see I, I have that, that time block from the KCTC, which KCTC, um, I'm sure you guys know what that is, but um, is, tech what? Career, Career tech, tech Center. Yeah. It's, uh, I mean, that's also helping me in the field of uh, interest that I'm going into. So um, it's given me a lot of flexibility and a lot of time. And actually, a lot of the, the biggest thing is people ask, well, do you even just talk to people there? Like, since everything's online, I mean, you listen to teachers talk to you online. <laughs> yes, because the lab is open, in a sense. You know, anyone can come in um, as a student, and then we can all talk to each other. You know, we have our breaks, so we can mingle, um, which is really nice. Um, and we build a good relationship with our teachers, too. So. Yeah. 
What really struck me was kind of what you've said in your theme is, is this is customized to you for your own learning styles and it's not stereotypical. I don't think, I think people who have an impression of online don't necessarily have an impression that might include you or might not. You know, there's a different, there's a different stereotype right now. And I'm glad you clarified the teacher piece because what I was impressed with was that you almost have a hybrid in effect, don't, don't you, when you? you Somewhat, yeah. Um, I mean, we use uh, some of the canned software, but at the same time, you know, the, the staff is there in support of that. Um, and some of the things that the canned software doesn't do as well, we've put some things in place to enhance that and, and to make it a little bit stronger. So yeah, in a sense it is a hybrid, but there's enough of that flexibility that you know we can address a, a, a pretty wide variety. The way we wrote the proposal, um, a student technically only has to be there the equivalent of one full day during the, the week, but you know we've put in place our structure that says you know you need to earn that before you can get anywhere close to that. You need to show us that you can handle that before we let you do that. And this really fits well with where the board's been headed in terms of what we care about are the, the, the breaching the levels of achievement and how we get mm -hmm. there should be less of a concern to us and. Um, if you're in a if you're in a traditional seat time model, you need time. But we're starting to find ways, kind of the way right. President Strauss said a moment ago, that there's in betweens for folks that have a unique need, and that will probably help us reinvent this system mm -hmm. over the next few years together. So I thought that was worth highlighting for you, and really appreciate your taking the time to join Thanks us today. Yes, thank, thank you sure. very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, how many years has this been? How many years have? We just finished our second year. Oh, just, so you are really So new. yeah, we were, uh, I think we were in the first three waivers around there. I think Traverse City was first. What's the student goes? Uh, we started out our first day with 10 kids. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. First day was what? Uh, I was the finished. first one. Oh. She was the very first, yes. No second. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the first two. Um, and then we finished up this year with a right around 70. Wow. Terrific. Oh, good. Well, I, I just want to mention that, that one of the speakers at the study group was Karen Cater, who's the director of the Office of Educational Technology for the U.S. Department of Education, and she was talking about various models. And she's coming to Michigan, I think, in the mm -hmm. fall, mm -hmm. and I, I told her about the school that I had, Liz and I had been to, West, Westwood Cyber right, High yeah. School, and, and she's, that's one of the schools she's planning to visit, so I don't know if she's going to your school. She was Not going to several of them. I don't know the other ones, but uh, so it's interesting. They they want to see what we're doing here. Yeah, yeah. So I think we're leading the pack right, right. now, and it's so because of the way you're you're really pioneers. Well, you're no, That's you're really you're uh, yeah. <laughs> frontier. <laughs> frontier. Yeah. Same thing. Frontiers right. of knowledge. I call it frontier land, but <laughs> <laughs> I know, but I love it. <laughs> Thank you again for taking the time to be with us today. Much. Appreciate it's it very much, and good luck to both of you. A lot. And then finally, I just wanted to say, you know, we, we, as you know, we have a visiting FIGA official that stays with us two years at a time with our, our sister state partnership and um, represents the FIGA province at events and does a research project. And we're kind of, uh, our current uh, person is, is just deciding on what that project will be. We're hoping it's education because we think that would be good for all. But I wanted to just introduce you to Janichi Tenaway, who's joining us just recently for the next two years. <laughs> Would you like to make a comment or you? Uh, my name is Junichi Tenoue from Shiga, Japan. I am very honored to have this opportunity to be here today. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Okay. Good, and um, we're going to move to public participation. Eileen. I have only two forms. Are there other forms? Okay. I'll we'll pick that up. And we're going to start with Sandra York. She, uh, Sandra represents the Michigan Congress of Parents, Teachers, and Students. Oh, good afternoon, everyone. And for those of you who don't know what the Michigan Congress of Parents, Teachers, and Students is, that would be the Your State PTA. So <laughs> we actually go by Mich Michigan PTSA. The S is an additional letter in there to represent the student portion. Um, the reason I wanted to uh, 
talk for a minute today is that I just came back from our national convention and I think a lot of people are not probably aware of an arts program that exists through PTA called the Reflections Program. And this year, Michigan had seven recognized um, students that won on a national level. The way the Reflections Program works, and I've been better off if I grab my glasses here, <laughs> is uh, that it's, um, it isn't, let me, let me step back a minute, it is an arts program that celebrated 40 years this year. And it, works uh, or, or is available for pre-K through 12 students in PTA schools and it encourages students to explore their artistic talents. This year's theme uh, or the 2009-2010 theme was Beauty Is and we had, uh, there, are, there are six areas that students can enter in dance, film, visual arts, photography, um, literature, and I'm missing one uh, because I wrote one twice, but that's all right. Um, nationally, there were over 500,000 entries this year from varying states. And in Michigan, we had um, more than 1,000. It might have been more than 2,000. I don't have that exact number with me. Um, judging starts at the local PTA unit. Winning entries there go on to the state level, and then winning entries from the state level go on to the national level. And we had seven students in Michigan that won. And one of the really amazing entries was from Daniel Fairbanks at Stevenson High School in Livonia, and he received an Outstanding Interpretation Award, which is the top award that can be received. And I'm going to just show this. I know you won't be able to see it well, and I apologize for that, but this is actually a painting that he did. You can view it on Michigan, at michiganpta.org or pta.org, and uh, w as well as a list of other entries. But I, but I want you to be aware, I mean, we all know that our students are awesome, and that uh, really the only reason if we view any children as not being awesome is because we're not doing the best that we can for them. Um, I have never, I've never been uh, under, uh, or be able to underestimate what I'm going to find. My background is mathematics. I've taught in many, many Detroit public schools through a contact program called Project Seed. And um, when I see things like this, I, I, you know, I just, I, I, I can't help but want to celebrate that. You know, we see the arts disappearing from the schools, which is a dangerous thing. It is, the arts are tied to everything. We all know that music is mathematics based. And I know as a child, not having had access to arts, I would have truly, truly disappeared into the woodwork. And for students who are shy, um, that it keeps you there. I mean, that really, it, you know, it, it's a huge piece of that. So I did want, I did want you to see uh, and be aware of that. And I'm, I'm, I, I need to do a better job of letting you know what's going on in PTA and your schools. Uh, we have PTA notes throughout the state. And for those of you who know PTA, we aren't just a parent group. We are the oldest and largest child advocacy organization in the world. And um, I, this is off topic a little bit, but I do want to celebrate the fact that this year our 54th Congress came on board and we celebrated uh, Puerto, Rico, Puerto Rico joining as a PTA unit. So that was very exciting for us. And I, I encourage you to go on either the state or national website to to look at this, and as for the board, I, d I have the, I unfortunately don't have one of these to pass along to everybody. Share mine. Yes, okay. and, and, and your president, Kathleen Strauss, has one as well um, that I dropped off today. So uh, thank you for your time, and I promise you that I will do a better job of keeping you informed of what we're doing in the schools. Uh, the last couple years have been a whirlwind for me when we moved the state office to Ann Arbor and um, coming on to PTA. Since I did not have a PTA background, I was really learning everything about it from the ground up. And um, I don't think I mentioned I am the executive director, um, so you will be hearing from, from me and seeing more of us um, at your meetings and just in general. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Sandra, one thank thing you. I'd like to say is Sandra's a member of the Ed Alliance, and I think really, it, it, what was the old commercial? Was it E.F. Hutton where when they speak, you listen? Or, oh, yeah. yeah. And, and I think measures the time to weigh in which is appreciated because some of us, and I'm probably guilty of that myself, say more than we need to say at times. But I very much respect your, your work with the Alliance and think it's been very helpful to us in the department. So thank you. Right. And, and, and thank you. I know that there's, there are a lot of things that I could weigh in on personally, but that's not why I'm there when I'm in those meetings. I am <laughs> representing PTA. So I, I, I have learned to keep my personal opinions for 
conversations that aren't around the table. So <laughs> I, at least I try. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mary T. Wood from Warren. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, I've come here again to address the board in regards to some charter school issues. First off, I want to introduce myself. I am Mary Wood. I live at 27533 Santa Ana in Warren, Michigan. And um, I kind of took a hiatus for a while until the charter school report came out, and I couldn't resist. Um, <laughs> after the fact, I'd just like to share some insights, though, because I did pull it up and I did study it intently. Um, I am very happy with the two-page profiles that have come out and with the additional information that's being shared. I don't know if everybody here at the table got a copy of that. Okay, I mean, it was kind of hard to download it in sections like it was, and I kind of went through and scanned it and took it out piece by piece as things got my attention. Um, but I uh, just wanted to share publicly a few things of insights that I had. Uh, one of the whole ideas with charter schools was to um, give um, people the opportunity to have a hands at doing things differently that maybe these things could then be infused into our public school system so that across the board everybody can gain. And it mentioned in the report that there was um, some grants available to have some schools share the innovative things that they've learned and are practicing. I went through and, and lifted up the information on those schools and I just wanted to mention that of the one, two, three, four, five, six schools that are here, all of them are being self-managed. And what I found what was lacking in the report was that there was no mention of the fact that we have, I don't know what the percentage is now, but it had been up to 75% of our schools was managed by management companies. And there's, that has been totally omitted from this year's report, which I found to be disappointing. Um, I did want to mention, though, in regards to a, a thing that caught my eye was that we do now have included this teacher-student <coughs> ratio. And I saw the numbers were quite low. Upon looking at the state report, well, that number is very low, too, which was surprising, one in seven. Um, when I see that number, I'm thinking of how many kids are in the classroom in front of that teacher. And usually the number is about 25. So the numbers that are coming out, one to seven, actually in the definition says it has to do with educational personnel in the building. And parents are going to look at this when they go through these charts and say, oh, you, you know, these charter schools, 11 kids per teacher or, or nine kids per teacher, not recognizing that the state level is seven students per teacher. So it's a little misleading when we really look at the numbers of how many are in a classroom day to day under, under one teacher. Um, I did get a chance, though, to uh, pull up also the... Um, uh, listing from that was on, online yesterday in regards to the schools at the bottom 5% and there are 14 charter schools on that list. I want to make a point here emphasize that if a charter school has been to the point of existence that they're at the bottom 5% here in the state, I do not want to see our tax dollars go to try to reform those schools. Those schools have a contract, and if they have failed to keep up to their academic goals in their contract, the authorizer should be shutting them down. Our tax dollars should not be invested further to try to keep these separate entities that said, hey, give us a chance, we can show you we can do it better, and now we need to bail them out. So that's my editorial comment on that one. Charles Drew Academy. Um, I did find out that, as we talked about this before, and I think I raised probably my last appearance here, my concern that... There may be two titles held on that. It appears that the land and the school building may have two separate deeds, one with the management company for the land and the school building now with the charter school. The Charles, the Charles Drew Academy actually purchased that building several years back, as we discussed here. Those are showing up on the Wayne County forfeiture list. <coughs> that, was taken over by, that school was taken over by a new management company and a totally new board. Um, pulling up the information of Charles Drew, uh, their unreserved funds off our two-page profiles was uh, 97000 So they're spending all the money they got, but they apparently weren't making their loan payments in order to be in good graces with whoever is holding their property. Uh, 
academics, as far as I'm concerned, are a little questionable, but that in itself raises my concern as to when do we step in and say we got a problem here. Central Michigan did decide to renew their contract for another year, which disturbs me that we got a school in this kind of financial difficulties and we're going to allow them to continue operating when apparently there's been some mismanagement. Um, anything else? I see my clock is running down. Um, oh, I just want to throw in one, one thing, last 10 seconds here. As we do, uh, are emphasizing across the statewide that our LEAs must look at how they can consolidate and how they can outsource in order to keep um, uh, expenses down and keep things operating. As we continue to allow charters to operate and expand, we continue to take individual schools that have their own superintendents, that have their own curriculum directors, that have their own um, you know, whatever, operating as a single building when we're asking school districts now that have multiple buildings under the, the administrative. So what we got is, is administrative kind of top heavy. And we really need to look at um, how we continue to have schools that are not doing so well continue to stay in operation because they're just getting by. And that seems to be acceptable. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And the last form I have, it has several names on it, so I don't know if you all intend to come to the table. Mercy Jones Lewis, Christopher Swanson, Dominique, Jock, Chandra Morgan, and, and Rita Smith. Is, is there only one person speaking, or no. tell me what the game plan is? Coming uh, as a group. As a group for 10 minutes? And yes. Good afternoon. I'm Mercy Jones Lewis from Colin Powell Academy. I bring greetings from uh, my boss, Dr. Phyllis Noda, who couldn't be here today, representing um, Colin Powell Academy and kind of going off of what Mary said about the public schools. We are a uh, charter, I'm sorry, charter school that has um, not been reauthorized by Central Michigan University and not because of non-academics not because of financial straits, not because um, of any, um, any, anything that uh, we've done, but because of, I think, what's called uh, a loophole in what we have in, in our laws when it comes to Central Michigan University or any authorizer for that point that manages and, uh, any of the academies that uh, are in existence. Central Michigan University um, does not have what I would call a watchdog. Who watches Central Michigan University? Who tells uh, what are the statistics or the facts that uh, points in the direction of a failing school? Um, I have brought forth uh, proof that we are not a failing school, that uh, our academics are great, and what has just come out is the, uh, from the Ed Michigan Education News release, struggling Michigan schools eligible for federal school improvement funds, and I just want you to know, and I'll pass it around, that we are not on this list, although we are up for um, not being reauthorized by um, Central Michigan University. Uh, also, we've uh, done a little bit of uh, homework, and we're finding that Central Michigan University um, does, does what's called dumping the bonds or um, from um, what I want to say taxpayers, um, just dumping it on the state. In other words, we, um, as bondholders, uh, have... Uh, bonds worth six million dollars and what has happened is, is that now that um, Central Michigan University is not will not renew us what happens to those bondholders what happens to that money they just get dumped so uh, we want to bring that to <coughs> your attention and in that want to really ask you to really look at another way that to watch the people who's watching us. You know what I mean? There should be an upper level over these universities, not just Central Michigan University, but other universities that authorize academies and um, have them have some kind of, um, some kind of, um, what I'm gonna say? 
guidelines, thank you, guidelines in order to shut a school down. So I'll let uh, Ms. Jack speak at this point to um, Hello, my name is Dominique Jocks. I am the current math coordinator at Colin Powell Academy, and I'm also a stakeholder in the community because I have the opportunity to work in the same community that I live in. My community has been rampant with the economy. We have a lot of folk foreclosures, and it caused many of our students to move in and out of the community. We have kept our assessment scores high. We have instituted new techn technological programs such as Study Island. We have did everything possible, even reaching out with parents, brought in transportation to keep our school open and at every turn we have been met with um, a lack of real assistance from Central Michigan um, University in my opinion. I've been there for three years and I can count on one hand the, the times that I've seen their presence in the building and moving forward it's about the kids in our school and our community and there's many schools who don't have the funding, and we do, and they are not being closed, and we are. And we're just asking the state of Michigan to not let our community fall anymore and to make sure that the authorizer makes sure that there's real, true gangs. If they come in our school and see the changes, the improvements we made to building, test scores, academics, after school programs, curriculum, I really think the CMU and the state of Michigan will have a different view in light of Colin Powell Academy, and I thank you for your time and your um, patience with letting me speak. Hi, my name is Chandra Morgan. I am a lead teacher, fifth grade teacher at Colin Powell Academy. I've been there for one year total this year, and um, I must say that coming into the school, we did hear that um, the school was going to be closed. But once I met the students and everybody got busy working and testing, all of a sudden I'm thinking there's no way they can shut this school down. They see the progress that the students have made. I think that in the fact that not just CMU but all uh, management companies, I as well as uh, Ms. Jobs live in the community. Um, I've been in my community for 12 years and also service the students so I see them many days walking past my house. But I think um, aside of education, we've done that. Besides that, we have children who speak English in school and they don't use slang in school because they've understood that the difference of this is your place of business and this is where you live which as adults we understand that so besides the education we've also impacted their lives in many different areas that we've had the pleasure of witnessing and then going back and reteaching outside of education and none of that stuff has been taken into consideration um, I think that CMU is being unfair and I agree that they do need uh, someone to watch over. Who's watching over the people that are watching us? Who is saying to Central, you want to close our school this year, but how many times have you been there? Have you ever met this teacher? Do you know the scores that this teacher has produced with these students? And they won't be able to give you an answer. I've met one person that was beginning at the school year, um, and after that, that, that was pretty much that. But I just wanted to stress the impact goes further than just education as well as outside of the school. And many of the parents are very, very happy with the progress that their students have made. Thank you. Hi, my name is Benicia Smith, and I am uh, the Executive Director Administrative Assistant. I have been with the school almost since its inception, sometimes not actually in the school because I was first with the the owner of the school. I'm associated with him in reference to the school. And this school has been in existence since 1996. And we have seen progress over the years in reference to this school. I have ha brought with me uh, over 2,000 uh, petitions that were signed through the community, the neighborhood, everyone with the, that is in the vicinity of that school. Everybody is trying their best to keep this school open. We also have a program that is called Open Arms. They come in and they service our children who go through grief counseling. And we have those different types of uh, services that are available in our school for our children simply because of the neighborhood that our children live in. There's so many different types of things that they encounter within the day-to-day -day basis that our school is able to meet and exceed in reference to like a safe haven for those children in that particular neighborhood. We also have across the street, it's called Positive Image. That particular program is a program for abusive and battered women where all their children, because they are in the process of getting their children back, attends our school and we make provision and stuff for those children within our school. So mainly, I'm, like with everyone else, we are here just to say who is watching those who are watching us 
in reference to keeping our school open and, and closing the schools and everything that pertains to the charter school system. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.